Ja, sehr verehrte Damen und Herren, liebe Gäste, liebe Freundinnen und Freunde, liebe Teilnehmerinnen und Teilnehmer des Ressourcengipfels, den die Heinrich-Böll-Stiftung seit heute hier veranstaltet, herzlich willkommen, Kate Ravers. Ich möchte Sie ganz herzlich hier in der Heinrich-Böll-Stiftung zu unserer Green Lecture mit Kate begrüßen. Und äh, freue mich natürlich und bin sehr, sehr neugierig darauf, wie bei Ihnen das Konzept der Donut Economics ankommen wird, das sie Ihnen gleich vorstellen wird. Ich bin sehr gespannt, wie Sie, auch wenn ich mich schon ein bisschen eingelesen habe, was der Schmalzkringel der Donut mit Ökonomie zu tun hat. Und ich glaube, es wird sich sehr schnell, wenn man dem Konzept von Kate lauscht, herausstellen dass dieses Bild vielleicht ein ganz schönes ist, Donut Economics. Sie sind hier und heute Abend Gast bei der nunmehr dritten Green Lecture der Heinrich-Böll-Stiftung. Die Green Lecture ist ein neueres Format der Heinrich-Böll-Stiftung, mit dem wir im Februar dieses Jahres begonnen haben. Mit Green Lecture laden wir Denkerinnen und Denker, Aktivistinnen und Aktivisten ein, um neue Ideen und Lösungsansätze zum Umgang mit den globalen Krisen hier in der Heinrich-Böll-Stiftung aus dem Ausland kennenzulernen. Wir möchten uns als internationale Stiftung natürlich eben bereichern lassen von dem, was in anderen Ländern gedacht und gelebt wird, wenn es darum geht, mit den globalen Krisen nicht nur umzugehen, sondern eben auch Alternativen nicht, zu, nicht nur zu denken, sondern auch Neues auszuprobieren. Wir sind überzeugt, dass wir mehr denn je Denk- und Diskussionsräume für die Gestaltung der Zukunft brauchen. Und ich glaube, es versteht sich von selbst, dass die Heinrich-Böll-Stiftung sich hier als Ort nicht nur fühlt, sondern auch als Ort anbietet, als Ort des Austausches mit jenen, die denken, forschen und neue gesellschaftliche Lebensformen ganz konkret ausprobieren. Wir wollen Protagonistinnen und Akteurinnen gesellschaftspolitischer, aber auch technischer Innovationen mit jenen zusammenbringen, die in der Tagespolitik stehen, weil wir glauben, dass diejenigen, die in der Tagespolitik stehen, eben gerade neue Denkansätze, wie sie in der Gesellschaft von unten entwickelt werden, oft gar nicht mehr ankommen. Wir haben deshalb für diesen heutigen Abend Reinhard Bütikofer, er ist Mitglied der Grünen im Europäischen Parlament, eingeladen. Ich äh, habe jetzt hier die unangenehme Aufgabe zu sagen, dass genau das Konzept von Green Lecture, Denker und Denkerinnen, Aktivistinnen und Aktivisten mit einem grünen Politiker zusammenzubringen, heute leider, leider nicht klappen wird weil Reinhard Bütikofer den Weg vom Straßburger Parlament nach Stuttgart und dann nach Berlin einfach aus Staugründen und aus sonstigen Gründen einfach nicht geschafft hat. Ich bitte es wirklich zu entschuldigen, es ging nicht und es ist natürlich auch schade, weil es das Konzept, ähm, wie gesagt, etwas außer Kraft setzt. Der heutige Abend... Diese Green Lecture steht im Zusammenhang mit unserem Dialogprojekt Resource Equity in a Finite World. Das ist ein ganz, ganz besonderes Projekt der Heinrich-Böll-Stiftung, das ich Ihnen ganz, ganz kurz, wirklich nur ganz, ganz kurz vorstellen möchte. Die Heinrich-Böll-Stiftung ähm, engagiert sich mit ihren Partnerinnen und Partnern weltweit seit mehreren Jahren ganz, ganz intensiv um Ressourcenpolitik. Wir verstehen Ressourcenpolitik als, eine sehr, als einen sehr umfassenden Ansatz. Wir verstehen unter Ressourcen nicht nur fossile und mineralische, sondern wir verstehen unter Ressourcen auch Biodiversität, Land, Wasser äh, und so weiter. Und wir dachten, dass es gut wäre, in den Ländern, in denen wir aktiv sind, in den Regionen, in denen wir arbeiten als Heinrich-Böll-Stiftung, vor allem die Probleme, aber auch Visionen und Zukunftsideen kennenzulernen, vor allem von der jungen Generation in den Ländern der verschiedenen Kontinente. Deswegen haben wir begonnen, vor anderthalb Jahren in zehn Zukunftswerkstätten junge Menschen, möglichst unter 30, und das ist uns auch weitgehend geglückt, zusammenzubringen, 
um über Ressourcenfragen nachzudenken, die sie in ihren jeweiligen Ländern und Regionen umtreibt. Wir wollten nicht nur Probleme analysieren und die Herausforderungen skizzieren, sondern wir wollten uns aber vor allem auch mit Lösungsansätzen auseinandersetzen. Was sind die Perspektiven, was sind die Visionen der jungen Generation in ihren Ländern, vor deren Augen das stattfindet, was wir hier kennen, nämlich einen massiven Ran auf die Ressourcen, eine Ressourcenbonanza, wie ich sie nenne, wie wir sie, glaube ich, so in diesem großen Stil lange nicht erlebt haben. Wir haben aus diesen regionalen zehn Zukunftswerkstätten jetzt nach Berlin zu diesem Ressourcengipfel Delegierte eingeladen. Viele von Ihnen sind hier. Ich sage auch hier von meiner Seite aus noch mal herzlich willkommen an alle, die zu diesem Ressourcengipfel gekommen sind. Diese Delegierten tauschen sich untereinander aus, arbeiten hier in einem zweitägigen Ressourcengipfel äh, an dem, was wir wollen, nämlich auch an Ergebnissen und Lösungsansätzen. Der Ressourcengipfel äh, heute und morgen ist nur ein vorläufiger Höhepunkt dieses Pro äh, Projekts. Wir haben vor, aus den Ergebnissen dieses Prozesses ein Memorandum entstehen zu lassen. Ein Memorandum, das wir neben den Zukunftswerkstätten begleiten lassen von einem internationalen Beratungs Beratungsgremium. Und mit diesem Memorandum wollen wir nichts anderes als Orientierung geben für politisches Handeln, Mut machen, Alternativen aufzeigen und natürlich Politik auffordern zum Handeln, damit diese Ressourcenausbeutung und der Ran auf Ressourcen, der mit massiven Menschenrechtsverletzungen einhergeht, ein Ende haben wird. Wir hoffen, im Laufe des Frühjahrs 2014 dieses Memorandum zu veröffentlichen. Ich möchte Ihnen Kate Raworth vorstellen. Kate Raworth ist auch ein Mitglied in diesem Beratungsgremium, das uns für dieses Memorandum berät. Kate ist Entwicklungsökonomin, Dozentin und Autorin und arbeitet als Senior Visiting Research Associate am Environmental Change Institute der Oxford, Oxford University. Von 2002 bis Mitte dieses Jahres war sie Senior Researcherin bei Oxfam International und hat daran gearbeitet, Entwicklung, Entwicklungsmodelle neu zu denken. Ein Ergebnis dieser Arbeit von ihr wird sie heute vorstellen und mit uns diskutieren, das Konzept der Donut Economics. Da Reinhard Bütikofer jetzt nicht da ist, glaube ich, haben wir noch mehr Gelegenheit mit unseren drei Gästen, unseren drei Delegierten aus den verschiedenen Regionen, die am Ressourcengipfel teilnehmen, viel, viel intensiver zu diskutieren. Ich freue mich wirklich sehr, dass Divya Gupta aus Indien, Kulsum Omari aus Südafrika und Edgardo Garcia aus Mexiko heute Abend mit Kate diskutieren werden über ihr Konzept. Sie werden es kommentieren, ergänzen, kritisieren, das wollen wir. Und Sie können sich natürlich vorstellen, dass wir dann auch im Anschluss daran mit Ihnen diskutieren wollen äh, zu Kates Konzept Donut Economics. Ist es das, was uns inspiriert? Ist es das, was wir brauchen für die Gestaltung der Zukunft? Ich freue mich auf jeden Fall und bedanke mich ganz herzlich bei Kate Ravers, dass sie hier ist, mit uns zusammenarbeitet, auch in dem Advisory Board. Ich freue mich auf Ihre Green Lecture und wünsche uns allen einen schönen, inspirierenden Abend. Bis gleich. Danke. Thank you very much. It's a big pleasure and a big honor to be here giving the Green Lecture. So to make the most of this opportunity, I would like to invite you to start a revolution in the way that we think. And you will just need a pencil. I will bring the donut if you bring the pencil. So let me explain how. I have four-year-old twins and they've just started school. And I'm sure that many of you here also have children, teenagers, gone into the next year at school, maybe going to university, learning a way of understanding the world that will equip them 
for being successful citizens in the future. So as well as thinking about my own children, I'm very much thinking about these students, economic students. In every country in the world, thousands of young people have gone to university, about to go, to study economics. Beijing, in Rio, Berlin, in London. And I'm, I think about them. I was one of them 20 years ago. I studied economics uh, and was very frustrated and walked away from it and find myself coming back because I know it matters. The language of economics frames so much of the public discourse that we have. Um, even if people don't go on to become economists, they go on to work in the media, as lawyers, uh, politicians, and that language really frames the public discourse, so it matters for all of us how economics is taught and learned. And I care particularly about this generation because, say, they're 20 years old now. They're going to be the policymakers in the decades from 2030 to 2050 through some pretty challenging times. If we want to see the vision of what they're going to have to economise, here's one way of looking at it, thinking about our global ecological footprint. Right now, we are living as if we had one and a half planets. In fact, next week is Earth Overshoot Day, the 17th of September, is the day in which we will have effectively used up this year's planetary resources, and then all the way to the end of the year, we will be living on overtime. So we're living off one and a half planets at the moment, and if we keep going, we'll be living off nearly three by 2050. And of course, we need to come back to one, because there aren't three out there. So these students, as economists, are going to be part of the generation that makes that extraordinary transition. So it really matters to all of us that they are pretty well equipped to do that. My concern is that they're not going to be. If your children came home from school with a textbook with this picture in it, you'd be pretty alarmed. I thought we had that sorted out some a couple of hundred years ago. Uh, and of course we have. We've made that paradigm change about understanding our place in the universe. And subtle though it looks, it's a big difference. And it really changes the way you think. Your worldview matters. I believe that economics hasn't yet made this paradigm shift. And so we're all struggling with the continuing teaching of the old paradigm, even if we know we need to move to the new one. When these students open their macroeconomics textbook, this is the diagram that they will encounter. It's at the heart of macroeconomics. Indeed, it's at the heart of national income accounting, the circular flow of goods and money. And it looks like a very, very simple diagram, but it's actually a very powerful one. It's so simple, it goes right in the back of your head without you quite knowing that it's gone there. What it shows us is that households sell their labour, their, their land, their, they loan their money to companies who give them in return wages, rents and dividends. And with that money, those households buy stuff and get goods and services. So it's a circular flow of goods and it's a circular flow of money. And yes, we can make it more complicated. We can add in a government sector with taxes and spending. We can add in a finance sector with banks. Let's not talk too much about what that will do to the system right now. We can add in a trade sector and talk about trade with other countries. But essentially, it's a circular flow going round. Now, to me, this diagram is problematic because it's so central to economic measurement. It's how we measure GDP. What is the gross domestic product? What's the value of those goods and services or the gross national income? So it's at the heart of the way we even talk about what the economy is and how it's growing. And that's a problem because it's fundamentally wrong in three, at least, three critical ways. And the first one, which is going to be obvious to anybody who's come here, is that the economy is not free-floating on a white background. It's not a circular closed system. It's utterly embedded in the environment and is drawing on natural resources and putting out pollutants all the time. And it's not even a closed system because we've got, we're sitting in a river of energy coming from the sun and there's waste energy. So entropy and thermodynamics, you never learn about this, at least I've never heard people learning about this in economics, but it's a fundamental fact of how the world and its energy systems work. So we're embedded in... Uh, the natural environment. Economists will say, hey, 
that's just that that's environmental externalities and you can go and do a paper on environmental economics well see, it's not externalities it's the very system in which we live and i don't want to go off and do a special paper i care about what all economists learn not the ones who go off and do the special paper the second problem is that not everything is in this monetary economy in fact Anybody here who's a parent and got kids up this morning and off to school or is looking after an older person or looking after somebody who's ill knows that a great deal of our well-being and our work is actually unpaid. And so the unpaid care economy contributes hugely to the creation of the next generation of the workforce, typically done by women, increasingly done by parents. Very valuable work. This woman has a bucket of water on her head Because when I was at Oxfam, I was so struck by the incredible work that women around the world were doing, carrying water, carrying firewood, growing their own food, always with a child on their back, all unpaid, not inside the monetized economy, but essential for the household's well-being. To this, the economics professor will say, is that feminist economics? <laughs> Maybe you could do a PhD on that? <laughs> but this is our daily reality. This is not a PhD. If we don't have this in the economic system, what are we talking about? And thirdly, it's not all about the market. So much of what we do, so much of the exchange and the quality of our lives come from voluntary exchange, from gift exchange. Think of Wikipedia. Think of all open source software, getting together to do art, music, activism. The social life is so rich and so much of what we, the goods and services, if you like, that enrich our lives are not things that we buy and sell. So to leave out the whole social story is to miss a very important part of what makes us lead good lives and feel prosperous. Now, taking that picture, then we can actually start asking much more interesting questions. If we just had that basic picture, the question was always, how do we make the economy grow? Because all we had was the arrows going round and round. Now we can ask many more questions. Can the economy continue to grow within the limits of the environment? Can we decouple GDP growth From, from the environmental impacts? Huge question, and a real question, not one that theory can dismiss. How can we get a, balance, a better balance between uh, our, our, the unpaid world and the world, the world of social exchange and the paid world? Can we be more flexible so we can have greater flexibility in our roles and engagement in the, in the paid workforce? How can we better recognize and reward and redistribute work in the unpaid care economy? So many more questions start to become possible and very real to, to the lives we care about living if we take an economics that starts from here. But many economists will say, well, that's all very nice, but that's much too complicated. You know, we can't do the maths. We can't create such nice models and do some very advanced calculations with this. So let's just stick with the one we've got. But it suddenly looks like a very impoverished vision of, of life. They might say, look, GDP isn't perfect, but let's stick with it because it's a proxy, it's a good enough proxy for what we care about. But we are living in times that have told us it's not a good enough proxy for what we care about because GDP may have quadrupled since 1970 and it's projected to quadruple again globally by 2050. But we know that there are many things that we care about that are not coming along with this GDP growth. Deprivation, an obvious one. Uh, by 2030, even though the global economy is expected to massively grow, one billion people are expected still to live in absolute poverty, and we see poverty in every country. Degradation. I already talked about the, the, the planets, but we all are fully aware of the extent of degradation that the current focus on GDP growth is causing and leaving this out of the picture as a special paper in economics. And inequality. Two-thirds of countries in the OECD are more unequal today than they were in 1980. In 2011, the, the U.S. economy grew, but 93% of that additional growth in the U.S. economy was captured by the top 10% of people. So GDP growth, we know, is not telling us enough about the things that we care about. So it's no wonder that our politicians, even though they are caught in this language, because we're all caught in this language, When they talk about growth, they, they want something a bit more. Merkel talks about sustainable growth. Cameron says he wants balanced growth. Obama has talked about long-term and lasting growth. Barroso, smart, inclusive and sustained growth. 
And so many words. It makes me think of going into a deli in New York and you just want a sandwich. And there's so much on the menu. What kind of growth would you like today? And here's just a little selection of all the words that we are using to talk about growth today. Which just shows we just want something more than growth. And I find it quite exciting because when a concept has to be so qualified, so uh, described in so many additional words, to me that's a concept that's ready to fall. We're just looking for something else that we could use instead. And because of this challenge, uh, the two Nobel Prize-winning economists, Amartya Sen and Joseph Stiglitz, were brought together um, to, by President Sarkozy of France to say, can you come up with an alternative measure of, of the economy? Well, they had a very good go. They didn't come up with a new measure. But they had a lovely quote. They said, those attempting to guide the economy and our societies are like a pilot trying to steer without a reliable compass. And so I do feel sorry for politicians who know, and I'm sure here, right in the middle of elections, you know, you know, we're trapped in the language of talking mainstream economics, even though we know it doesn't deliver what we want. But the danger is to the politician who dares to step into that other language, because the mainstream is going to knock you down. So what if we could put a compass into their hands that actually would give them a better compass for aiming the economy at. Let's try and help these politicians get away from the short-term focus on the next quarter's growth and look at the long-term picture. So let's look at the really long-term picture. Here's 100,000 years of the planet's history and its temperature. And what this graph shows is that our planet has had an incredibly variable temperature. And then just in the last 10 to 12,000 years... It's been remarkably stable compared to everything else, known as the Holocene. And it's no coincidence this is when agriculture began. It's no coincidence this, this is when all human civilizations have sprung up in this period. So there's something very special about this stable phase of our planet. And that's what caused Earth system scientists, led by Johann Rockström of the Stockholm Resilience Center, to say, what is it about this phase of our planet's history we should find out before we lose it. And to me, it's extraordinary that they start asking this question because since the 14th century, we've been trying to understand this thing called the human body, this system, and how all of its different systems interact and what are the limits of pressure that we can put on it. How long can you go without water? How fast can your heart beat until you have a heart attack? How high can the temperature in the body go? We've become masters of medicine of the human body. And yet, we're just at the beginning of doing the same thing for this planet. What are the fundamental systems that we depend upon and how do they interact? And how much pressure can we put on these systems? And what will happen if they go over the limit? So luckily, we've got 21st century scientists on our side, not medieval doctors, because we really need them and they're working very hard and very fast. What they've proposed is that there are nine essential planetary processes that we need to stay on the safe side of a boundary, the nine planetary boundaries. So we need to be in the green area in the middle of that diagram and stay away from putting so much pressure on any one of these systems that we're risking going over a biophysical threshold, over a tipping point, into changing that system into a very, very different state that is not nearly so beneficial to humanity. So not putting so much uh, so many greenhouse gases in the atmosphere that we cause climate change. Not withdrawing so much water from the world's water systems that we actually change the hydrological cycle, we change the water flow. Not putting so much nitrogen and phosphorus through fertilisers into the soil, which leaches into the rivers and the oceans and causes eutrophication. Great green areas. There's, a, there's an area the size of, I think, of Mississippi in... Um, the Gulf of Mexico, due to the runoff from agricultural lands in America. Not causing the ocean to acidify. Again, the uh, carbon dioxide dissolving in the ocean causes acidity. It can kill coral reefs, kills off the fish life, it kills off the food chain. Chemical pollutions, all sorts of different chemical pollutions. How are they... We're putting so many unknown chemicals into the, into the uh, life system. How is this changing the formation of life itself? Atmospheric aerosol loading, 
so sulfates and particles that go up and actually change the monsoon cycle. Ozone depletion, stopping uh, too many CFCs and ozone-depleting substances so that we have closed that hole back up. Biodiversity loss, turning huge areas of land into monoculture because biodiversity and diversity means resilience. So we risk making ourselves more vulnerable and land use change. If we change the land from its natural state, again, we are making ourselves less resilient. And of course, all of these are interlinked. So if we put too much pressure on one system and we've made ourselves more, uh, less resilient in another area, it's all the more vulnerable to change. So they said these are the nine planetary boundaries. And then they said, where are we in relation to those nine boundaries? So they made a first estimate of the pressure that we're putting on them. And you can see that, according to their estimate, we are over at least three of the boundaries, way over on climate change. We know this one. They estimated the climate change boundary at 350 parts per million, and we've gone over 400. Everybody's talking about this one, but are we talking about nitrogen so much? They estimate the ma maximum amount of nitrogen that we should be releasing into the atmosphere around three, 35 million tonnes per year. And we're nearly three or four times over that. And biodiversity loss is ten times what they believe is a sustainable background rate of species loss. So we're way over on three of the boundaries and moving towards the edge on many, many other ones. If we could come back inside that space... They, they said, this would be a safe operating space for humanity. Now, I was very excited when I first saw that diagram because what I saw was that box of the environment around the economy. I felt as if where economists had said, no, we're not going to draw a box around this circular flow, is if the natural scientists had said, well, if you economists won't draw it, we'll draw it. Here it is, and it's in our metrics. It's in natural metrics. And you can, now you can interact with that. So I was very excited as science responding to economics. But when I look at it, I thought, that whole space isn't a safe space for humanity. Because if we were right at the middle of the circle, that would be zero resource use. That's where humanity is putting no pressure on any of these systems. Or we'd all be dead. Because humanity requires resources to live. So there's a space in the middle where we don't want to be, because it would be a space of deprivation. In fact... We want to use resources. Every human has the right to use resources to meet their human rights. We need resources to meet our rights to health, to food, water, to have income, to be educated, to be resilient, to have voice and a job, to have access to energy, and to have these things with social equity and gender equality. These 11 issues I took, I crowdsourced them from the world's governments in the run-up to the Rio conference. I went through every single submission to Rio by the governments and looked at all the social issues they were talking about. And these were the 11 that more than half of all the governments mentioned. It's not a perfect set, but it's a good start to saying we're all committed to making sure every human has those resources. So we can put the two together and say humanity's resource use must ensure that every human being has the resources they need to meet their human rights, get everybody out of that blue space in the middle and over a social foundation, but that collectively we do this in a way that keeps us within planetary boundaries. So we need to be in the donut-shaped space in between. It's not just a safe space, it's also a socially just space for humanity. And I tried to say, if the, economy, if, if the scientists say, where are we on the planetary boundaries, then where are we on the social foundation? So using United Nations data, I filled it in for every dimension that I could get international data for. So, for example, on food... The little blue strip between the orange wedge and the green circle, that blue strip is the 13% of people in the world who don't have enough food to eat. If everybody had enough food, the orange wedge would go right up to the green circle. Oh, on income, 21% of people live on less than $1.25 a day. So that's just, this is just the bare, bare minima. I mean, you know, you're, this is just surviving at the most minimal level of, of meeting your rights. So on every dimension, people are living in appalling deprivation. And so that's a real statement of the status of human development today, that many millions and billions of people still live in extraordinary deprivation on their most basic of their human rights, and yet we've already gone over at least three of the planetary boundaries. So how are we going to change this? How are we going to redistribute and improve the way we use the planet's resources 
so that everybody gets over that social foundation and we come back within the planetary boundaries. And to me, that's one way of drawing a compass for the 21st century, one way of giving a compass to our politicians and to our economists to say, if you want to think about what you're trying to do with economic development, these should at least be fundamental guiding principles of where we're trying to get to. In short, the rights of all within the planetary boundaries. What if each of us indeed could use this as a compass in our own lives? What if each of us could sit at a table and think about how does the impact of my life affect the planetary and social boundaries? What I eat, how I travel, how I vote, how I consume, how do these things have an impact? And what could I do to make my life more compatible with this vision? What if every company had a board table like that? They met uh, to discuss the corporate strategy around a table like this. A joke it may sound, but I've been meeting in the UK with some companies that are interested in reflecting on their strategy and saying, come on, let's put your products on the table. Let's tell the story of your company through this lens. Can it be improved, the impact you're having on human rights, the impact you're having on planetary boundaries? What could you do if you wanted to say you are a donut brand? Imagine if the world's governments could meet around this table. Okay, that's not actually the UN. That's Dr. Strangelove. But, uh, but I presented this idea to the UN General Assembly last year. And I said, I think you need a new table because it would really help us think a planetary style, help us think about the big collective that we're all here to p pursue, not just the individual national short-term interest, but the long-term collective interest. So I think this, just having a vision can really make a difference. And I've been very struck by the interest in this picture. After all, it's just a picture. And a lot of people seem to be interested in it. To me, that's a very powerful sign that we are looking for a new way of thinking. We are looking for a new vision to direct ourselves towards. This is one way of drawing it. But what's more exciting is that many, many people are searching. And I think it's an opportunity that we have to pick up and run with. But I still come back to these students. And I still worry about what they're learning. Because I think they're learning from the same textbooks that I learned from. And they don't take us anywhere close to where we need to get to on this challenge. There's a quote from Buckminster Fuller, which I love. He said, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. So there's a real positivity about that. Don't criticise, criticise, criticise. Show me what you're for. Show me something different. So I got excited by that idea. And I love the idea that if, if I could construct the toolbox for the 21st century economist so that they were equipped with the tools they needed to take on the challenges they face. What would you, what would you put in that toolbox? I know some people like to play uh, fantasy football. What's your fantasy football team? I'm playing fantasy economics. Like, what would be your fantasy economic syllabus that you would want the world's economists, the world view and the tools you wish they had and the discourse you wish we lived in? So I'm going to tell you about my fantasy economics. First thing I'm going to put in the toolbox as a start is a donut because it gives us a big picture of staying within planetary boundaries. So it's got that planetary ecological thinking and it's got human rights and it's, let's say, constraining conditions on economic development. We want more than just staying within these things, but it would be an incredible achievement if this century we could get within that space. So that's the compass. And then a map. If we have to have the circular flow of goods and money, let's at least extend it to not only include the market economy, but also to include the natural, social and human resource flows that depend upon for our very daily lives and our own prosperity. Because that's going to take us more towards a, a sense of what we actually care about in our lives. So we've got a compass and a map. And I just want to tell you briefly about five other things that I would put in my fantasy economics toolkit. I would love in the discussions afterwards to hear things that you would put in your toolkit or some of the things that I'm going to put in that you would take out. Uh, because I, I find it an exciting way of rethinking the paradigm. So, what else am I going to put in this toolkit? First of all, that's a shoal of fish. Uh, they're swimming around, they're creating a bait ball to catch something. But it's a complex, emergent, and adaptive system. And I would put in my toolkit for economists, you know, economics needs to be about systems analysis, because the economy is a complex, adaptive system. Economists are taught about equilibrium, coming from Newtonian physics. It's long gone. 
Only economics has got that still at the center of its vision. We need to move towards a much more subtle understanding of the system we're working with and develop the skills of critical systems thinkers to be good economists. The second thing I'd put in my toolkit would be to say, well, we're not fish, but we're also not rational economic man. We are heuristic humans. We are subtle, complex, but we don't narrowly follow our own self-interest and maximize our utility. Yes, we have self-interest, but we also have altruism. We compete and we collaborate. We care about others. We do all, you, you, you can nudge us into behavior and we follow rules and we're inspired by stories. So behavioral economics has a lot to help us revise the way economics models humanity because we've got to get beyond this very narrow rational economic man that we're told we are. We are not, and we refuse to be that. And we want to be managed through a policy system that recognizes our multifacets. So behavioral economics, put that in the toolbox to think about our real natures. Thirdly, I would put right in the heart of it a much more explicit discussion of social goals, of social justice and values. Because many economists say the, the good thing about economics is that it's value-free, it's positive economics, not normative economics. It's not. Every paradigm has values embedded in it, even if they're tucked in the bottom drawer so you can't see them. We need to bring them out and make them explicit and have much more open debates about the values that we are pursuing through our economies. So I would love to make that, bring human rights right into the heart of thinking about economics. The moment they jar... How can we reconstruct our economic thinking so that they fit? And then along with our humans and their more subtle ways of working, I want to think about more subtle forms of governance. Because often the market rules say, if you create property rights and then we can trade in systems, this is the solution. But of course, that's just one of the many, many solutions. And the work of Eleanor Ostrom, who was given the uh, prize in economics, Nobel Prize in economics, shows that actually there are many different forms of governance for common pool resources that can work. And at planetary scale thinking, we are thinking about many common pool resources. So we can aspire to other sides of our nature that actually manage to collaborate and commonly uh, govern resources together and not just go do everything through the market. So bringing in Eleanor Ostrom's work on uh, governance and, and thinking more widely about how we can govern resource use. And then lastly, a dashboard. A dashboard of how we measure what we're doing. A dashboard of multiple metrics, not just in monetary metrics, but in natural metrics and social metrics. Never slavishly living by the dashboard, but we need, if we've got a compass and a map, we at least need to know how we're doing on that journey. So those are some of the elements of my fantasy economics toolkit. Um, and I look forward to discussion in a moment of yours. But I'm still with these economic students because when they open their textbooks in a month's time, it is going to have this picture in it. And so here's where I invite you to a revolution. And you just need this pencil and a little bit of nerve. I invite you to go into the study of every economist you know, into the libraries where the textbooks are, into every student's room, and find that book on the shelf that says macroeconomics. And flick through, you'll very quickly find this diagram, the circular flow of goods and money. Just draw in the environment. Draw in the unpaid care economy. And draw in social capital and social flows. And you'll be doing those economists a huge favour. <laughs> opening up the, the world view. They'll be asking questions in class and transforming the way we think. It's a very small act, but of course our world views are extraordinarily powerful. And we often don't even know they're there. So I invite you to join me with your pencil. I'm, I'm blogging about this and debating about this all the time, and I'd love to discuss with you later this evening. If you have any ideas from tonight for later, please send them to me. I would love to hear them. Um, and I very much look forward to our conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kate. I think it was inspiring, as I uh, already announced it. And, um, Kate, you made a very good proposal when we prepared for this uh, evening. Kate hat vorgeschlagen, dass Sie jetzt fünf Minuten lang sich mit Ihren Nachbarn, mit Ihrer Nachbarin darüber unterhalten, was Sie denn zusätzlich zu den fünf Elementen, die Kate in die Toolbox für eine andere Ökonomie getan hat, was Sie in diese Toolbox tun würden. 
Wir würden das begrüßen. Reden Sie mit Ihren Nachbarn. Sie werden heute Abend noch genug zugetextet. Keine Sorge. Sie lernen vielleicht auch nette neue Menschen kennen. Was würden Sie in die Toolbox tun für eine andere Ökonomie? Bitte. Wir reden auch.
Möchten Sie noch weiterreden miteinander? Es springt an. Hallo, wo ist das Mikro? Es springt an. Ja, ja, ich weiß. Hallo. It works. It takes some time before it works, yeah. I'm normally used to that. So, ich hoffe, Sie konnten diese fünf, sechs, sieben Minuten mit Ihrem Nachbarn, mit Ihrer Nachbarin genießen. Wir haben, das kündigte ich schon an, jetzt sofort, bevor wir dann mit Kate in eine intensivere Diskussion zu Ihrem Konzept gehen, auch von Ihrer Seite aus, drei unserer Teilnehmerinnen am Ressourcengipfel gebeten, Kate zu kommentieren, natürlich das Konzept äh, der Donut Economics. Und ich möchte als Erste Devi bitten, vom Indien. Sie wird zu Ihnen sprechen. Do you come upstairs? Okay. And please introduce yourself. That was what we told before. Good evening, everyone. Uh, uh, congratulations again, Kate, for the wonderful, wonderful lecture. I really like your concept, and I'm, I'm really thankful to be here to be able to present my perspective on your lecture. Um, I, I appreciated the fact that you included the aspect of values, that uh, when we talk about development, values should be clearly defined and they should be clearly understood. And uh, that's what I think most of the countries have been dealing with, because when it comes to environmental problems, Uh, it's just that the values are not taken into account and that makes the environmental problem wicked. And it's just so difficult to solve them. So I'm really happy that you included the factor of value. And then I'm also excited the fact that, you know, you included uh, Ostrom's work in your toolkit. I, I didn't introduce myself, so um, yeah, I, <laughs> I participated in the India workshop and... Um, I am a PhD student at Ohio State University in the U.S., and I'm actually working on some of the Ostrom's work. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm thankful that you, you, you brought it into, uh, uh, you know, you discussed and you shared it with the, with the audience today. Uh, however, you know, I have a few questions, and uh, they are not really, uh, they're basically my concerns regarding uh, your approach. Uh, It's just that I'm not comfortable with the term economics. When it comes to development, I am not comfortable with using the term economics because that just the, the, the word economics itself, it just makes it profit-driven. And uh, I feel that if, uh, especially in the context of developing countries, if we can focus on the well-being of the nation, of the health and the education of the people, then I feel that the, econom uh, the economic development would come I mean, once well-being, health, and education is restored, the economic well-being or the economic development would uh, be as, I mean, would be one of the outcomes. And uh, secondly, I was quite surprised that you didn't mention the role of big corporations, because I feel that, you know, in the morning lecture, you talked about the, the, the inequity in the distribution And I feel that uh, inequity is mostly driven by the big corporations who go ahead and they establish their manufacturing units in the developing countries. And uh, you, know, you also had this aspect of, uh, of human rights. And uh, that is one of the factors. You know, this, these big corporations, they are depriving the local communities of the human rights. They just uh, they push these communities out of their own their own areas and they establish these big manufacturing units and and the whole aspect of again over exploitation and uh, uh, over consumption is driven by these big corporations so i i think it would be great if your model could include something uh, a sort of a message for these big corporations that's that's all for me thank you thank you Thank you, Divya. Um, we are really, really brief. I would like now to ask Edgardo Garcia. Please come upstairs and comment. And introduce yourself. Yes. 
Good evening. My name is Edgardo Garcia. I'm from Mexico. I'm I live in the south of Mexico and I work in a little organization. The name is University of the Earth. And we are trying to find alternatives to education, not alternative education, instead alternatives to education. And we are um, we are working with some communities that are defending their territories um, from big corporations. Then it is my my job. <laughs> and now I want to say thanks to Kate for sharing with us their proposal and um, their amazing collection of data allow us a reality that we lived in Latin America and in Mexico for a long time, a very unequal model of economic model. And I want to talk about a little bit what means development uh, and sustainable development for, for us in Mexico, in my view, because um, I have the sensation that here in Europe, the word development or sustainable has a, a very good image. And we live in a country where we have uh, disqualified because we are under development or developing country. Since President Truman in 1949 uh, coined the world, the word under development, disqualified us as under development. And what we have to do is to follow the path of the countries of the first world to be developed. And now develop in my country, in Mexico, in the south, uh, mainly is occasioning environmental destruction and is displacing thousands of people from their territories. We have uh, more than 200,000 displacement uh, people uh, for the construction of big dams. Uh, we have uh, persecution of activists, we have repression, we have 263 mining foreign corporations operating 677 projects with five-year concessions covering a third of Mexican territory. Uh, more than the 50% of our territory is sold to big corporations. And it is development for us. And now the idea of sustainable or sustainability for development is a new discourse to legitimate and perpetuate the um, exploitations of our territory of our territories because for example, our governments are using the discourse that they are doing green energy or that they are improving the, the development um, to justify the exploitation and to give in our territories to the companies. And it is why I am very impressed that you have this view of that uh, developed countries can share in, then can sit in a table and and share this donut, <laughs> but for us it's a different reality. And I just wanted to share with you that we have that in in our country, and that for us sustainability and for the people uh, sustainability is only a discourse. It's not it's not a reality of real um, intention to change the the way, but. Um, I don't fly to Berlin to tell us a sad story. <laughs> I want to tell you a, a very happy story. And I'm going to tell my friend if he can put the, an image in, in the screen. Because um, Kate talked, about, talked us about to change the mentality and to have a revolutionary attitude. And uh, we have. We are asking us uh, why do we have to follow your same path? What develop development or sustainable development has to be a recipe or a universal standard for everybody in all over the world? Why do we have to to be a European country in Latin America? Why? And this is our my question and some question for some of us in Mexico, and um, we think that we have the capacity to create our own path 
and uh, achieve achieve this path. And this symbol is a redesign of your donut. <laughs> um, but this symbol has um, a little more time, thousands of years. Uh, and it is a Mayan symbol. The, this is a symbol from the Maya culture. Uh, Maya culture is a very old culture in Mesoamerica, in the south of Mexico and Guatemala and Central America. And they lived there thousands of years before the, the invasion of the Spanish people to our territory. And uh, this is an alternative view of the world. Uh, a view from communities that have lived with nature thousands of years. And with this symbol, I want to explain a little bit about this symbol. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, this symbol, the name of the symbol is Caracol in Spanish. Uh, and it means that they do not think nature and humanity s separated. They, they think that the men and woman and child and elders are the same that the rock, that the wind, that the sun, that the water. And they, this is the, the symbol of the in, integrality of the nature and human life in, in, the, same, in the same movement. And this symbol has not an, uh, a beginning uh, or an ending. It can begin here or can end here, and it can begin here or end here. Um, and because they talk in a continuity of, of the life, they, they believe that they will be walking. And it is not a, a cycle because they believe that the life... Uh, is working always, and it is always improvement. And now, in the south of, of Mexico today, Mayas already live. And they say that it is not necessary to change the world. Simple, we need to do it again. And um, there are more than 50,000 people, Mayas, that are creating autonomous communities in the south of Mexico, and they have uh, uh, their own uh, health system, their own education, their own uh, uh, productive uh, projects, their own their own corn, and they food their own food, and they are, uh, it is only an example of that we can do that, that it, it is possible to have a different way than development or sustainability. Not because it is more good or better, only because we want to, to have a respect that we can manage our own lives. And I have a dream, or we have a dream that we want to share with, with you. And we dream with a world where many worlds can be embraced and it is no longer a dream because it is happening every day in some places all over the world. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing um, experiences and um, just bringing to us uh, an own vision and an own symbol. Um, I would like to ask now Kulsum Omari to come. Thank you. I, I don't have a new symbol to share with, <laughs> but I have some thoughts on your presentation. Um, my name is Kuthum Omari. I am uh, with the Henry Paul Foundation from the Southern Africa office, and we're based in Cape Town, and I'm responsible for... Uh, the sustainable development program for, for the region. Um, just like the other colleagues have thanked you, um, Kate, thank you very much for that very insightful um, uh, presentation and your thoughts around an alternative to development which we really, really need to think about and unpack. I commend you for that because I think 
the planetary boundaries should provide and could provide a safe, innovative, and a socially just space for growth and development. I think what you provided us is food for thought, and I think we need to think about it more seriously. Um, I'm going to pick one or two things that you said and just and just comment on those so that we have more time for discussion. Um, the one is around the climate change um, that you talked about. I think it's I think it's known that under the business as usual scenario, that is not even an option to continue business as usual with regards to addressing climate change in this age of planetary boundaries, which we all accept. I think we need to rethink um, development and the challenges uh, in the context of climate change in two ways, in the context of political and ethical um, context. Um, I bring this up because I think we have a deadlock to some extent in the negotiations of climate change. And one of the issues is around the ethical and equity issues. The ethical challenge around climate change negotiations and the path to a low-carbon energy system I think needs further unpacking as we begin to implement this uh, donut or we begin to chew on this donut. Um, I believe it still remains the responsibility of all countries, um, rich and poor, to deal with, uh, with, with, with climate change and ensure that we're on the path to low carbon development trajectory and to decarbonize our economies. Um, how to address that convergence by the rich and the poor on the right to development becomes a real question and is something that we're struggling with uh, in the international negotiations. Everyone needs to take the responsibility the question of fairness and equitable access to sustainable development that is expressed in the climate change negotiations and also guided by the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities, I think we need to really further unpack. And my question to you um, is how do we deal with the issue of fairness so that all rich and poor countries take full responsibility? Um, and I'm speaking this um, as, as an African who I know will feel most vulnerable economy, most vulnerable content, continent rather, um, our ecosystems, so that our ecosystems can adapt, and so that food production is not threatened, and it enables a sustainable economic development. So I'd like to know your thoughts on that, Kate, and what does that mean for our economies, and how will we get political support for, to move forward? The second thing I'd like to comment on is around markets. Um, you mentioned that, Kate, and I know that markets are increasingly seen as a solution to contemporary environmental problems and a solution or an approach to sustainable development. Yet markets have not solved the challenge as we know it. Uh, more than 3 million hectares, I'll give you statistics that I've collected, over 3 million hectares of forest have been cleared not just for multinational companies that you alluded to, but also from our own governments creating uh, protected land and forcefully removing communities out of those land, denying them access to, to forests and to natural resources that they're used to. Uh, many communities have lost rights and access to land um, due to this partnership between multinational companies and our own governments in Africa. Some to create parks for ecotourism, which supposedly will boost our economy. Um, although poverty has reduced in few industrialized countries, but more than 20% of the world population still remains in absolute poverty. And we begin to unpack that regionally. We see that the, the, the figures are scarier in, in Africa. Um, why has this been accelerated? Nature is being reduced to its elements. Commodification and privatization of the environment, which has led to new forms of land and resource exploitation through water privatization, carbon sequestration as a response to climate change and dealing with emissions, uh, creating new protected areas of land taken from the poor and the marginalized. And for me, um, I feel the suppression of indigenous forms of production and consumption, they have been suppressed. So my question is, this accumulation by disposition remains a real problem, and how do we address that? Um, because I think keeping within the safe operating space that you, that you have beautifully presented, I think we can't do that without addressing 
commodification, privatization of nature. And the last very, very short comment is around governance. Um, one of the most difficult but very, very important challenge will be the governance and a new kind of leadership in our continent, not just in our continent, I think globally we need a new kind of leadership. Um, after the discovery of so many metals and minerals in our countries, it has led to the destruction of the environment, human rights abuses, displacement of communities. Due to this very weak governance and natural resource revenue that does not really reach government coffers and therefore does not serve the very purpose it was meant to serve, this is, which is to lift people out of poverty. In fact, I think for me it does the opposite. It further exacerbates and entrenches poor governance, lack of accountability, and contributes to stagnating economies while undermining development. How do we lift this veil of secrecy around the extractive sector, for example? Um, my, my feeling is we need to give governance more content, move away from a strategic top-down approach to give governance more ethical and political dimensions. Thank you. Thank you, Okay, Kate, you got uh, the comments. Uh, I would say uh, many questions as well. Uh, new problems um, arose, so please, it's yours again to comment. Yeah, thank Back. you. <laughs> and I'll, I'll just do this briefly so that we can open up yeah. and have a, a bigger conversation, but thank you for three really great uh, points of view and, and challenges to me, which is always a great thing to get. Um, I'll just go briefly. Divya, you, you said very interestingly, I don't like the idea that it's economics because economics is profit-driven. And it's a little bit like uh, Eduardo is saying, development, and these big words have come to take on very particular political meanings. And sometimes we should just reject them because we should say, I cannot reclaim this word, so I will not use it. Uh, economics, when I think of economics... Its Greek origins mean household resource management. Um, in, indeed, girls used to go to school and be taught home economics, which was cooking in England. <laughs> household resource management. Um, I think we can reclaim the notion of our household. I think it's our planetary household. And we do indeed need to manage the resources. But it's a very good question. For what? Because it's been captured. Resource management for profit. And actually we can reclaim it. So resource management for well-being. And then we've got a much bigger and interesting question of what is that? And then how do we best manage those resources for well-being? So I, I want to hang on to the word economics. I, I very rarely would ever stand up and say I am an economist. Somebody asked me today, are you an economist? And I said I was an economist. I don't know what I am now. And maybe this subject won't be called economics. Maybe economics will go off and become a slightly strange branch of mathematics. And, and we'll have to invent another subject, maybe somewhere in the School of Geography or the School of Natural Sciences or the School of Studies of Wellbeing. We just need to bring the discourse and the political power along with that new subject. Um, but I, I, I understand the, the frustration with the word. Eduardo, I love the new image you put up uh, and the shape, and it reminds me of when I was first writing this paper and I said it's a donut, and a lot of people said, oh, I hate this donut, this American junk. This is the worst image. And one of my American colleagues, he said, I think it's a croissant, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he, at first I thought he was joking, but actually he had a really good point. He said, you know when a croissant is made, you, you turn it around and around and around. And, it, and it's the interstitial layers, he said, the, the interconnectedness of the natural to the human and the human to the natural. So actually it should be a croissant. Which, and I thought your Mayan symbol was... Is that a croissant? They were onto this thousands of years ago. Um, but I, I like that, that reframing of it. And I love the idea of the university of the earth. I want to come and get an alternative to an education in your university. Um, alternative to education. Yeah, yeah, no, an alternative to an education. Exactly, exactly. And um, then, Kulthum, your, your great comments. Uh, big, you've offered, you've set me the big challenges, and this has happened to me a few times. I think I've just drawn one little picture that says maybe this is one way of drawing the challenge. And then people say to me, how do you solve it? And I say, I don't know. I don't know any more than any of us. Uh, this is a way of drawing the challenge. And actually, I, I really like visualizing it as a table because I've found that people from very difficult, very different political opinions have said, I want to use this. Some people say, I want to use this because it proves we can have green growth. 
And I say, oh, really? Okay. I, I want to use this because it, and other people say, I want to use this because it proves we can't have growth. So it's actually can be quite a powerful frame that different people with very different opinions can come to and have a debate about different ways for getting there. So I claim no, um, I claim no great insight on all the answers that we face. You, the climate change negotiations, how we're stuck. One thing that I, just to mention on is, uh, in, in terms of how do we ensure fairness, and the economics we have at the moment says, look, if I have money I, and something's for sale in the market, I can buy it. I can buy the meat I want, I can buy the jeans I want. I, and, and yet, everybody's now talking about footprints. What's your ecological footprint? What's your carbon footprint? Now you can find your nitrogen footprint. What's your land footprint? What's your water footprint? I think it's really interesting that we're interested in these footprints because to me... The rise of footprinting means people are very have an instinct that it's not okay to ration the world's resources by income. Because I, why do we need to know about why, why do you need to know my footprint? I've got this money. I buy what I like. The money gives me out, the allowance to it, the permission to use it. But it doesn't. We have an instinct that it matters how big each of our footprints is. So if I could see into the future, we've been doing a lot of future visioning here today. I do believe that footprinting will be much bigger nationally and personally. Many people can talk about their carbon footprint now. You know, 10 years ago, people would have thought, what are you talking about? But we, we are learning new metrics for, for measuring and judging our lives by. And I do think that in the future this will come through and it will come through as a more explicit debate about fairness. So I'm optimistic because we're getting the metrics that at least make these things explicit. But I will leave it there because I, I very much look forward to a big open discussion. Yeah. Thank you, Kate, uh, for your comments and uh, some answers. I would like to put a question on the table. Um, you said you took the 11 elements in the inner circle from the Rio Plus 20 process, a um, government-driven process, I would like to say. When I first looked at the inner circle, I saw some attempts to include, give people a voice, and other elements. I think the message should be a bit stronger. I think we have to fight for full participation, not just a voice. Voices can be heard, but they will not make a change, probably, yeah, to stay within the boundaries. Um, so why you didn't choose democracy, full participation, other real important elements like rule of law, like the basic human rights, not just human rights? Um. Yeah, that's yeah, no, a great question. So uh, I wrote this paper in um, around uh, early 2012, and I was looking at the planetary boundaries framework, and there are these nine boundaries, and uh, around 30 leading Earth system scientists had got together and come up with these nine systems. I mean, think what an incredible achievement that is. They could have just had so many things in there and they, they limited themselves and they focused and came up with just nine. And they have the authority of being leading Earth system scientists. So when I thought we need a social boundary as well, who has the authority to write the social boundary? And I was thinking, should we just say, well, here's Oxfam's version of it. Do we just put Oxfam's? But then people will start arguing, well, why does Oxfam have this or not? Should we call together leading development thinkers, get Amartya Sen, Mary Robinson, Desmond Tutu, you could also do that. I didn't feel I had the convening power to <laughs> call those people <laughs> up. Um, somebody said to me, look, we're coming up to the Rio summit. Every government in the world is writing a document to Rio saying what they think their social priorities are. Why don't you take that? It's like a pulse of the moment. And I actually thought it was a brilliant idea because it, was, it took me a long time. I had to read, you know, a hundred and something documents and go through line by line. But when you come out with these 11 issues, and I then presented this in Rio and to governments afterwards, and they're staring at these social issues, I say, where did I get them from? I got them from you. Thank you for these. Thank you. This, by the way, these are the 11 issues you all said. And so the governments couldn't argue with it. And then, and then, of course, it's imperfect, but I didn't, I didn't want to focus the argument on what was there and what was missing because the point is the concept and the inside isn't perfect. I would like to add housing. 
I would like to add personal security. I would add those straight in, maybe communications, mobility, democracy. But the governments hadn't said democracy. They said voice. So I, I stayed with what the governments had said. So it's, it's a very weak, uh, a weak description of it. But even if we could achieve that, that would be a step forward. I would like to ask you several more questions, but I promise to the audience uh, to open to them. Um, bitte, wenn Sie jetzt ans Mikrofon gehen, die kommen zu Ihnen, wenn Sie sich melden, dann stellen Sie sich bitte kurz vor und kurze Kommentare sind erlaubt, aber keine Co-Vorträge und erlaubt sind natürlich äh, Fragen aller Art und Los geht's. Auch gerne nochmal an unsere drei hier, an Kusum, Edgardo und Divya. Okay, hier vorne. Hier, die, der Herr. Bleib. Christine, bleibst du da? Und, gut. Okay, uh, I'm Andreas Oberheitmann from Green Security Alliance. And I have a question on your donut, actually. Um, the factors that are inside the donut are, well, structural Uh, factors. Uh, X percent of world population have an income below one US dollar or something. Um, my question is, uh, what about the, the impact of the growth of uh, world population? What does it do to the donut? Um, you said uh, your uh, starting point was if you are in the very middle of the donut, if nobody consumed anything, um, we couldn't live. But uh, our world population is growing now. It's 7 billion. Soon it will be 10 billion. What does it do with the donut? Will it get uh, thinner? Or what is uh, yeah, your question, your answer okay, on that? I'm an artist. My name is Ulla Korn. Um, I just was listening to you, and I liked it very much, your lecture. And I was listening to the guy from Mexico, and I just wonder and make that question to myself also, th that maybe this concept that you have proposed is beautiful for like our, like our world, the, like the Western world, but how do I know if this fits the other people, they are living in a different way? And I don't like that idea to have a global thing. I like more the idea of like, you tell me, you know what's best for your country. And you develop, and, and I feel a bit like with, within the European and maybe even the American also, I feel a little bit like uh, we cannot take care of our, of our country. So better we go to another country, it's more easy to work there, and they are more like somehow we have more success in little ways. But we have so huge problems in Europe and in, in, in the United States that I feel we cannot, we cannot solve. So I would, what I propose is like more or less like we have to work in our countries to make it work. And then it will have an effect to the global world. That's my idea. It's my vision, what I have. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I would like to ask uh, two questions. First, um, have you ever had comments from economists on your ideas? And I wonder what, 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 what are they? And the second one is, um, do you think it's necessary to convince um, the mainstream economists, like those who publish in like American Economic Review or something like that, to, to, to accept the idea? Yeah. Okay. Two questions. Thank you. David in the back. Da wir eine Übersetzung haben, darf ich auch auf Deutsch fragen. Oder? Ähm, David Bartelt, Büroleiter der Heinrich-Böll-Stiftung in Rio. Ähm, ich hatte bisher immer gedacht, ich werde meinen Kindern empfehlen, dass sie Chinesisch studieren sollen. Ich mal kurz die ja. Okay. okay sorry. We start again. Sorry. Ja. David Bartelt vom Büro der Heinrich-Böll-Stiftung in Rio in Brasilien. Are you hearing me? Ja, okay. Yes. Ähm, ich hatte bisher immer gedacht, ich werde meinen Kindern empfehlen, Chinesisch zu studieren, aber jetzt habe ich doch noch mal gedacht, man sollte wirklich Ökonomie studieren und mit diesem Bleistift losziehen, von dem Sie gesprochen haben. Wobei ich schon auch glaube, es gibt alternative Ansätze in der Ökonomie 
Und äh, es ist auch da eine Frage, wie sich äh, innerhalb so einer Disziplin Machtverhältnisse widerspiegeln. Die Ökonomie äh, ist tatsächlich eine Wissenschaft, die sehr selbstbewusst ist, aber deren Prognosefähigkeit und deren Wissenschaftlichkeit eigentlich in umgekehrt proportionalem Verhältnis zu ihrer politischen Relevanz stehen. Denn es ist ja nicht nur die Ökonomie selber, sondern es ist die Ökonomisierung des politischen und aller Lebensbereiche, die wir erleben und die besonders besorgniserregend ist. Wenn es nur die Ökonomie als Wissenschaft wäre, da gibt es, glaube ich, in der Tat auch alternative Ansätze. Aber dass wir von einer äh, neuen Ökonomie der Natur sprechen müssen und uns mit ihr auseinandersetzen müssen, dass wir ähm, uns ständig mit Finanz Finanzökonomie auseinandersetzen müssen, das ist sozusagen das Besorgniserregende. Und jetzt bin ich bei meiner Frage, denn es sind die Regierungen selber, die sich sozusagen diese Ökonomisierung äh, zu ihrem politischen Programm gemacht haben. Und ähm, es ist also nicht nur eine wissenschaftliche Frage, sondern es ist tatsächlich eine politische und auch eine machtpolitische Frage. Und diese Dimension fehlt mir ein wenig in Ihrem Schema. Sie haben am, Rech äh, am Schluss dann... Ähm, dieses UNO-Bild, was aus diesem Dr. Strangelove-Film ist, gezeigt, aber Sie haben nicht gesagt, wie Sie denn in der UNO dann die Machtverhältnisse herstellen wollen, die dann die Entscheidungen auch tatsächlich treffen können, um Ihren schönen grünen Sicherheitsbereich dann auch herzustellen. Und äh, das würde mich doch sehr interessieren, wie Sie das äh, umgesetzt sehen wollen. Wow, Kate. I wish you all the best to answer all those questions. <laughs> wow, great question. Um, can I stand up? Oh. Gosh, all these questions. Um, I, of course, I, when you're asking a question, there's a reason you're asking a question. I want to turn it back to you and I, what do you think? I know this is a question. What do you think? Um, so let me start. The first one was on population. Yes. Population matters in an obvious way. Is it possible to put the slide up back up from here? The donut picture back up? Is it possible to put my slide up? Oh, is that? Oh, okay, sorry. So, um, the social foundation, what does it take to meet that social foundation for everybody? Uh, it's obvious that if the population gets twice as big, it will take twice as many resources to meet that social foundation. So, very often, the question of, well, population is going to uh, affect this. It will take more resources to meet the social foundation. Um, however, I'm an optimist about global population because the, the, the rate of growth of the pop global population is, has been coming down since 1979. For the first time in human history, it's coming down because we are succeeding in development. It's not coming down because of crisis or famine or war, but because humans are getting better off and are choosing and, enable, and women are particularly are empowered to have smaller families. And there's actually a lovely connection between population and the social foundation, which is if you help people achieve those elements of the social foundation, they are then empowered to have smaller families. Women's empowerment through education, gender equality, health jobs and income and voice, this it we know is the main way to enable people to, to manage the size of their own families. So these things go together. It's actually the consuming population that I'm particularly concerned about. So I showed you earlier a picture that 13% uh, of people don't have access to enough food. And we can say, well, what would it take to, to get everybody that food? It would take 3% of the global food supply today. And we throw away between 30% and 50% of it. So the amount of food to get everybody out of hunger is 10% of what we don't even eat. It's fractional. In contrast, if we look at the nitrogen boundary and think about the sustainable amount of nitrogen, it would be uh, 35 million tons. Well, one third of that sustainable nitrogen budget is currently used to grow animal feed to, grow, to make meat for Europe. So when we're talking about resource consumption, it's actually the high level of consumption of the well-off rather than meeting the most basic needs of the poor that I'm most concerned about. So the population question always sits side by side with the consumption question. It's sort of two sides of a rectangle. If we want to think about resource use, population and consumption, it's the consumption one and the inequality of that which really worries me because I see it getting worse, not better. Um, I like this question, is, is this donut Western? Um, I don't think it is. Is it okay? The donuts American, but if it was a croissant, it could be European. Um, 
but the planetary boundaries were were uh, the science understood by the scientists as pertaining to the planet, no matter where. And the social foundation comes from the world's governments, the majority of whom are not European or North American. So, so actually, this isn't a Western one. I would love to take your question and turn it back to Eduardo and say, Eduardo, does that look Western? Is that a Western concept to you? Those, those 11 uh, foundational issues for humanity, is this me imposing a Western idea of development? I, I, it isn't, because it's the world's government said these are the social issues, but we could still say, does it come across as a sort of Western conception? Are there some of those we say, we don't all want those things? They are actually, almost all of them, recognised as human rights, many of them in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. But it's a really interesting question whether this is Western. I don't think it is. I think a lot of the solutions to this lie in the West, around the nitrogen use that I just used, around cutting carbon emissions, because a lot of the excess, excessive consumption of resources is Western at the moment. So the solutions to that need to come from here. Um, the question about, see, and I, the gentleman who asked me the question, do economists, see, I really want to know what you're thinking. You're asking me these really interesting questions. Do, what do economists think, and do we need to convince the mainstream? I, I would never put my energies in trying to convince the mainstream. So I'm with that Buckminster Fuller quote that says, look, don't fight the reality, just go make something else and see if people come to it. Um, and it's much more exciting and creative that way. But of course, everything that I've mentioned is economics. It's heterodox economics. I didn't make this stuff up. There's brilliant economists who've been doing this for decades. So on the ecological economics, it's thanks to... Herman Daly, Georgescu Rogan, Joshua Farley, on the feminist economics. Uh, I, I'm naming the British and, and, and English-speaking ones. Of course, I'm sure there are German and European equivalents. Uh, Diane Elson, I think of on the, on the feminist economics. Nancy Fulbright. Uh, so all of these have heterodox economists. What's interesting, coming to and, and sort of addressing both these questions, is about the power relations. There was a very interesting paper done in the UK recently looking at UK economics departments in universities and some economists did an economic analysis and show that there is systematic bias against heterodox economics in terms of how it's assessed when the universities are getting their funding. They assess which journals did you get published in. Well, which journals are the good journals? The heterodox ones are not the good journals. So there's a systematic bias against rewarding heterodox publications and employing heterodox economists. So it does come back to the power. Who has the power to change the university department? Who has the power to rewrite the textbooks? I do actually believe that some of the rewriting of economics is going to happen outside of economics departments for this reason. I myself am affiliated to the Environmental Change Institute at the University of Oxford in the School of Geography. Uh, and they've said, you know, I'm, I'm teaching this idea of the donut. I'm going to be running a, an elective course next year on um, is economic growth possible? You, you wouldn't get that in Oxford University Economics Department. So I feel, I don't say this on record, I feel like I've pushed open a little door in Oxford University and here's a little bit of heterodox economics, you know, and let's have the discussion. So it's, I think some of, some of the changes are going to happen elsewhere. And then coming to your, your question, um, but, but very similar questions, and I really like these questions about the power. Uh, I also worry that economics is becoming the language of everything, economising nature, and we have to... You know, behave, psychologists do some interesting work, and economists turn around and say, oh, that's behavioural economics. Well, no, it's not. It's psychology. No, and not everything is economics, and there is a danger that economics becomes a megalomania. Um, I think one of the shifts that needs to happen is that economists need to stop being like a prima donna or the, the, you know, the first lady singing or dancing on stage and become a member of the choir so that economics needs to become part of a much more diverse set of tools. When I, when I was at a meeting um, in the summer with Johan Rockström, who was presenting the planetary boundaries and he's really the mind behind this, and we were talking about economics, I said to him afterwards, what would you really like to see done differently? And he just said... I just, I just wish the economists wouldn't try to do all of it. They would just do some of it. And, you know, this is a really profound point. He, he's bringing the economists in, and they take over. And we put a value on everything. And where we see a value, we hear a price. And where we hear a price, we, we see a market. And where we see a market, is it for sale? And then it's gone. So this language is, do, is powerful. And profits. And profits, yeah. So 
and, and maybe the, the use of the language of economics in uh, politics is because economics is understood as profit. But actually, if we can reclaim it as the management of household resources and define our household in a very big way, we could reclaim that word. So I'm trying to reclaim the word. Let's see if it succeeds. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. An interim applause, definitely. Um, Divya, since you stick so much to the time for your comment, would you like to react uh, to the lady's question? I, I, I saw you <laughs> saying, yeah, the donut probably does not fit for countries like India. Would you like to comment? Sure. I don't really have an answer, but then I, I mostly I agree with her because... When I um, heard Kate's lecture in the morning and then uh, again today in the evening, I just felt that this model is more suitable to the Western country because it's focusing on the resource, um, the, the inequitable distribution and inequitable uh, consumption. So it, it felt as if it was more, uh, more uh, applicable to the, the developed countries than developing countries because the consumption pattern in the developing countries is not, I mean, you, you cannot compare it to what it is in the developed countries. So um, even like when you take into account the ecological footprint. So um, I actually kind of agree with what she said. So. Would you react again on that? Yeah, I, I, know, I find that fascinating. I mean, if I was sitting in India, I, I, what I understand is that India is, is using its groundwater supplies far beyond their renewable capacity. So we've got a real problem on freshwater use in India. And yet millions of people in India still don't have access to water. So right there, we've got a really interesting challenge at the level of India of how do we look at our total water availability, bring it back within its, its self-renewing capacity, but extend it so that everybody in India has access to water and we use it more efficiently for growing food. Um, so... I, I know I find it very interesting that you say this seems like a Western model because all those issues in the middle are, are human rights that uh, governments of every country have said we want these things for our people. So, but I, I, I don't want to fight back against that. I'm really interested in the idea that this looks more Western. I, personally, I, I, I don't see it that way. Um, but I'd love to keep hearing. And if look, if anyone has any real challenges, and really, I, I'd love the critique. Okay, yeah, we are going into the next round. Um, Please, show me who want to speak. It's you. Who else? Over there. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Da sind auch welche. <laughs> Hinter dir, Heike. <laughs> okay, yeah, I see you. No problem. Um, hi, my name is Gitanjali. I'm from the India office of the Heinrich Böll Foundation. Um, I just want to take uh, forward from what the last comment was. Um, and I... Uh, Kate, we had this discussion earlier about how we look at the um, other factors that play into how all of this gets affected. And I, I wonder if uh, where Divya is coming from is where we look at all the factors that come in to mess up this entire equation, um, where we're talking about the mafia, where we're talking about the, the elites. And I think this is something that um, all of us discussed in the World Cafe earlier this morning, was all the problems that come between equitable distribution of resources. And I was wondering if this comes into your set of considerations when you uh, propose this, um, this as a model. And um, also where you stand in terms of uh, the feedback that you've got, the criticism that you've got, and how, if at all, you would rework this entire model. Thanks. Hello. I have a comment and a question coming out of the comment. Um, my name is Jago Damunic. Okay. I see that something is missing in my start. Um, so first the comment. When I see these three circles, there is environmental and there is social. And it reminds me of something else. It reminds me of sustainable development model of three pillars, and the third pillars would be economics. And in 2005, IUCN has remodeled the pillars into circles, having their mental circle, the outer circle, and economic circle, the inner circle. And how I read it is uh, 
that economics actually should serve both social and romantic. So it's not basically they're not equal, but there is one which is external and the one which is coming from the society internal, like economics. So in that sense, if there's something missing in Donut, it's like what economic model and what characteristic of economy would serve to live within these environmental borders and to achieve these social aims. And therefore, I would like to ask you maybe about opinion. You said some people react to this donuts uh, saying, oh, great, this proves that green, green growth is possible. Others are saying, no, it's not possible. So uh, my question is to you, what's your opinion about it? And have you developed maybe model in that direction? Like what, is, what are the characteristics of economics that could serve the purpose? Thank you. Two more questions, please. Um, I can't remember the exact person, but so. Okay. Hello, Ursula Fuentes from the Environment Ministry, working on climate change. I have a question uh, and a comment on, on those uh, on that branch of the discussion we had regarding whether that's a Western model or not, and that maybe has also something to do whether it's a donut or we have to turn it into a croissant, because um, what. What puzzled me a bit is that when we talk about the environmental ceiling and the nine dimensions you, you worked out, they have a, a, an implication also for development and for people. Like, I mean, talking about climate change. Climate change, the ceiling is not just there for the planet. It's the ceilings we're defining, like the two-degree uh, target, is mainly there for the people. And we now know a lot about the implications of climate change for development um, And, and how, how threatening uh, global warming beyond two degrees, for example, would be in particular for development in, in many parts of, of the world. So I'd like to hear your views on that. Thanks. So, okay, noch eine Frage. Deine nehme ich auch noch und dann würde ich sagen, machen wir eine Schlussrunde. Hm? Sie noch mal? Okay. My name is uh, Tommy Simpson. I'm from the Green Foundation in Ireland. And I'm just, I, I think it was an excellent presentation, but my concern is mainly about the time scale and, and, and the time we have to bring about the desired changes. And uh, I think this is where the politics and the power play comes into it. And from a green perspective, and I've been involved in green politics for more than 30 years, Uh, it is, uh, you know, it is sometimes, uh, I am very sceptical about what can be achieved in the, uh, in, in the time. And uh, so I, I'm thinking here that people are being fooled. And I think here of uh, the Abraham Lincoln comment that you can uh, fool some of the people all of the time and all of the people some of the time, but you can't fool, fool all of the people all the time. But I, I, I don't agree with that. I think most people are being fooled most of the time now by, by the public relations machines of the multinational corporations and every other uh, the financial institutions that are out there. And so I do despair sometimes about whether we can bring about the changes. So I would like you to address the, the time scale in trying to bring about the desired changes. And uh, just very, one, very briefly, I'm thinking here of the the Robert Kennedy speech in Kansas in 1968, where he questioned the whole uh, measure of uh, gross national product and how it's measured and what it didn't measure. And, uh, and therefore, even that was 1968, 25 years ago, and no either politicians or, except the Greens, of course, who are questioning this measure, and you mentioned the new metrics and uh, footprints, and hopefully that will become mainstream, uh, but I do uh, despair over the time, and maybe you could address that. Thank you. Thank you. Sie noch mal. Dame? Ne, Sie brauchen immer ein Mikro. Okay. Um, I just want to add something else, because maybe you can tell me, Kate, uh, where would you put the knowledge that, for example, the indigenous people have what we don't have? like about plants, about how they lived in the future and they have used all the resources in a way that was sustainable. So how, how to put this into, because I feel a little bit like 
There is so much knowledge that I would like to read from, from those indigenous people in, in South America, in Africa, and everywhere, and bring it here that we get to know more about nature. Okay, thank you. Okay, bitte. Da kommt schon. Guck. Thanks. Uh, my name is Jan Kowalczyk. I work for Oxfam. Uh, so a former colleague of Kate. Uh, we're still missing Kate very much in Oxfam, of course. Um, maybe, Why did um, you let her go? <laughs> well, <laughs> okay. Um, now, sorry, sorry. I, don't, I can't answer this because I don't know. Um, Now, I wonder, I'm, I was quite sort of desperate about this environmental ceiling thing because I can understand, yes, we need to get people out of the hole in the middle into the green strip and make sure they don't go over the environmental ceiling in going forward. And uh, maybe this, is, this story is fairly easy to tell because you can do things like, okay, let's have these countries all leapfrog into the age of the renewable energy thing so don't do the wrongs of the, that the industrialist countries have done. Okay, maybe the story can be told. But the other part, getting all these societies that are far beyond the environment space back into the green bit means you have to tell them you have to do with much less. And... Uh, And all these stories about, oh, we can keep our well-being in our saturated societies without, uh, and we can reduce emissions and resource use, but we can stay wealthy and have a good society and all these kind of things. They just don't believe it. And, uh, or let's say they, they, they pretend this is possible, uh, but when you look at the numbers, there's hardly any indicators this is possible. What, one quick story why I'm saying this, because in these climate negotiations that I'm following since a couple of years, the European Union every time puts up a slide showing uh, we are decoupling emissions from economic growth. So we are moving into the green bit. And then afterwards, once, at least one of the emerging economies puts up another slide that says, no, you are not, because you're only exporting your emissions to our countries. So we are producing your products, but you are the ones consuming them. So these are your emissions. So your economic growth is not decoupled. So decoupling that would mean changing societies. And now my question is, really quickly, sorry, uh, is because the resistance of adopting that model, I mean, you can tell economists this is a better model that shows how the world works, and maybe they agree to that and then textbook changes, but the resistance will come from societies that they, they don't want to change that model in the textbooks because it would mean they would have to completely change the way their society works. So it's not only the economists that are old-fashioned, it's the sort of structural resistance you have to face. Okay, another fundamental, crucial question for another lecture. If you, if, you, if you would like to allow me, I really would like to close the session by giving Kate the last word. Uh, because I think many of us are in this room almost since 10 hours, I guess. Uh, so I think we need somehow like a break or a get together by some drinks and uh, we can talk downstairs um, and continue our conversation. So, once again, Kate, inspire us. Many of them are connected, so I'll, I'll relate them together. Um, Angeli's saying, you, you've got this, this model, um, and does it include all the problems? I, it's not a model. I have, you know, I have to be more humble than that. It's just a vision of a place that it would be fantastic If we could get there this century, it doesn't have any answers in it. And maybe that's one of the reasons why it's got so much attention. I have to be honest, I'm completely gobsmacked. Can you translate that into German? I'm <laughs> amazed how much interest there has been in this picture. When I saw the planetary boundaries diagram, I thought, hey, that's really cool. Hey, you could draw this little social thing in the middle, but... That's just funny old me, and I put it in the bottom drawer for a long time. And then someone said, that, that, you know, that's... And eventually got it out. I am amazed by how much interest there is in this picture. And I... So, why? One, I think the planetary boundaries concept is very powerful. And I've built on that. Two, because I've added to that the social story. So suddenly, you know, WWF and Oxfam... You're environmental, we're, we're poverty. No, we're doing the same thing. All their NGOs, all the people who care about different 
uh, environment and poverty. We don't have to be polarised anymore. We can have one picture that shows us the, the, the social and the environmental in the same story. And by the way, it has the economic in it as well. I didn't say it out loud, but you can see it says inclusive and sustainable economic development. In the run-up to Rio, I took this around many of the embassies in New York to the, to, to the um, missions and said, what do you think of this picture? And quite a number of the, in fact, the Argentinian um, representative who was leading the G77 at the time, she said, I've always thought of sustainable development like this. If only you could make the Europeans think like this. <laughs> and then I went to the European Union and they said, yeah, you know, yeah, you know, and our, our Latin American colleagues, and they talk about this, um, co uh, uh, what do they call it? Um, Pachamama, Pachamama, and the sort of buen vivir, and we all think it's a bit fluffy. But actually, it's not very different from this. If only you could get the Latin Americans to think like this. So I was really struck that they, they all connected with it in different ways. But some people said, okay, so you've got the environmental and you've got the social, where's the economy? And I thought, well, the, the economy is precisely in between. And what's nice about this diagram is that instead of starting as that circular flow of goods and income does, starting with GDP growth and say, okay, there might be some externalities and some people might get left behind, but let's go with growth. We start with the fundamentals. We start with human rights. We start with ecological integrity. So we put our fundamental values of life in place and then we derive the economy. Then we say, what kind of economic system would be compatible with that? And we can have that debate. Is a growing GDP compatible with it or not? It depends, coming to Jan's question, on whether or not we can have absolute decoupling. And I agree, agree with Jan, it's, it's for our countries here in Europe and in America and Australia, the countries that have massive footprints that have to do absolute decoupling, not just of carbon dioxide, but of resource use. If they want to keep growing, they have to have GDP going up and resource use coming down year after year after year. That is an extraordinary path to promise. The thing that amazes me is that there are so many institutes with the name badge and the business card. I'm from the Global Green Growth Institute. I'm from the Green Growth Mission. And it's like, wow, this, this thing exists. And we haven't even seen it yet, but everybody's got it on their business card. I want to see this green growth, and I want to see it in Europe. Don't take me to a developing country that say, well, we're going to protect the forest and that's green growth. Maybe for them, that's a greener growth. Green growth, the really tough test of green growth is here. Let's prove that this idea can stand up before we put it on our business card. That's just my personal view about green growth. Um, to the lady from the Environment Ministry who, who asked about the, the, is these environmental boundaries, I'm really glad she said that because I should have said when I was presenting this, the planetary boundary concept it was derived from that graph I showed you of the Holocene and the temperature of the planet and what does it take to stay in the Holocene. And the reason that the Earth System scientists were interested in the Holocene is because it's the place where humanity has thrived. It's an entirely anthropocentric concept. It's, so planetary boundaries are not drawn up for tree frogs and they're not drawn up for polar bears. They might be good for animals and for biodiversity and for nature, but they are essentially defined around humanity's needs. And that, to me, is exciting because it means that you can't say, well, that's an environmentalist agenda. It's not. It's a humanist agenda. And so, it, again, it, it, it breaks down these environment and humanity uh, problems that we, we're constantly facing. Um, Tommy's question about, do we have the time to do this in? And... Of course, I would never say, everybody stop lobbying the climate change negotiations and come and let's teach economics instead. No, we have to do all of it. Um, but I'm struck that I studied economics 20 years ago, and I get out the textbooks, and they're the same, and that's so wrong. Uh, the, at the London School of Economics, uh, the students organized a conference this summer called Rethinking, e Rethinking Economics, and they said, would you come and talk at this, and we're inviting lots of heterodox economists. And I said, well, isn't that what you've just been studying? And they said, no, we, we just did this master's degree in economics and it was completely mainstream economics. And now at the end of our degrees, we are voluntarily organizing a conference for the economics we wish we'd learned. So, of course, the student body had this expectation and a desire to learn the new thinking and it's not coming through. So I'm excited about meeting their expectations there. Um, I think I'm going to stop there. And lastly, just to say... This is just one diagram. Let's hope that we move past it and evolve it and improve on it. But I'm so struck by people's desire for a visual image that captures what we want. I believe images are incredibly powerful in shaping our worldviews. And so we must keep drawing and redrawing the future that we want. Thank you.
once again, Kate, um, thank you so much. Um, the applause is yours. Um, I think you made it quite at the end again clear. This is a vision. And I think our task is to come as close as possible to that vision. Planetary boundaries are already a fact. It's not a vision. We are really already over um, consume and over exploit uh, Earth's resources, and we are far than ever from equity and democracy. Ich möchte mich an dieser Stelle ganz, ganz herzlich bei Ihnen bedanken für Ihre Beiträge, für Ihr Mitmachen hier. Ich möchte mich ganz, ganz besonders bei den Übersetzerinnen bedanken, die schuften hier auch. Einen kleinen Applaus bitte. Ich möchte mich auch an dieser Stelle bei den wunderbaren Mitarbeiterinnen und Mitarbeitern der Heinrich-Böll-Stiftung bedanken, die heute und morgen und auch den heutigen äh, Event heute Abend organisieren. Den Resource Summit, das Memorandum, den ganzen Prozess, das sind Lili Fuhr und Christine Chemnitz. Das sind Björn Ecklund, Annette Kraus, Janine Corduan ähm, und ich hoffe, ich habe jetzt wirklich niemand vergessen, die hier eine wunderbare Arbeit machen. Ich glaube, es ist deutlich geworden, dass wir als Heinrich-Böll-Stiftung unsere Beiträge leisten für diese Vision. Sie dürfen jetzt noch Gast hier bei uns bleiben. Ich möchte Sie einladen zu Getränken und ich glaube auch Brezeln. Und nutzen Sie die Gelegenheit und führen Sie Ihr Gespräch von vorhin. Was tun Sie in die Toolbox für eine andere Ökonomie weiter? Vielen Dank fürs Kommen und alles Gute. Applaus